Hello and welcome to eConversations. I'm your host, Dr. Dan Sutter of the Johnson Center for Political Economy at Troy University. Burger King was founded in Florida in the 1950s, but in 2014, an international merger led to the company's incorporation in Canada. Burger King's defection from the U.S. was essentially driven by an effort to reduce the corporate taxes paid to our federal government. Burger King was only one of the most prominent of a recent series of corporate inversions. Things that are designed to reduce the taxes that a company pays. What exactly are these corporate inversions? And what are their costs to our economy? And what should we do in response to an increasing number of companies effectively renouncing their American corporate citizenship for tax purposes? Joining me on eConversations today to explain what these corporate inversions are and their impacts on our economy is, our new, is a new member of our Johnson Center staff, uh, Courtney Mikulak. Courtney, welcome to Troy and welcome to eConversations. Thanks for having me. Well, if you could first uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and the, the job that you have here with the Johnson Center. Sure. So I'm a policy analyst for the Johnson Center based out of Montgomery, um, where I work on state public policy and the issues that Alabama is facing specifically. And where, do you, where are you coming to, to Alabama from? So I'm coming from Washington, D.C., okay. a little bit farther away, um, where I got my master's in economics at George Mason University. I was also an MA fellow with the Mercatus Center while I was there. Uh, so I focus specifically on tax policy, um, development policy, and the public perception of economic ideas. And where are you from originally? Originally from East Tennessee. Oh. So. Well, I guess you're, you're not new to the South, <laughs> so, but we won't hold it that you're from Tennessee against you. So, well, let, let's get started here talk about what I think you know could be a, a pretty uh, daunting subject. This whole, whole term corporate inversion sounds really, really complicated, almost com combining like chemistry and finance uh, in, in something that sounds pretty, uh, pretty difficult to get our hands on. But uh, I think once we get into it, we'll see it's not as, as daunting as, as it sounds uh, on the surface. But this is based out of some of the research that you did while you were at the Mercatus Center, right? Yes. So this is based out of a policy paper that I did with two of my colleagues um, looking at the cause of corporate inversions and the solutions. So 2014, 2015 were pretty big years in terms of mm -hmm. corporate inversions. The White House uh, directly addressed the issue of corporate inversions. So it's become sort of a hot button issue in the policy world. Um, so mm -hmm. we took a little bit of a deeper look at what's actually going on. And corporate inversions are complicated and they are very complex, but the solutions as I think we've uh, discovered and some other economists have also looked at, they're actually not that difficult. Mm -hmm. So let's start here with Burger King. So Burger King was founded in, in, in Florida. We think of it certainly as like an American company, all, all, you know, right up there with McDonald's and, and some of our other fast food companies. But now like Burger King is a foreign country company. I guess they've relocated or, or reincorporated now in, in Canada. Um, so explain a little bit how this works. Is did you know? Obviously, we still have Burger King restaurants here in the United States. So, what was involved with uh, Burger King's uh, corporate inversion? Right. So, Burger King, founded in Florida, as you said, is now um, headquartered out of Ontario. Mm -hmm. So, they cur they recently in 2014 merged with Tim Hortons, which is a well-known coffee and donut shop in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, and they merged and relocated their headquarters in Ontario. Now, what this means for us in the U.S. is, as customers especially, is essentially nothing. So, this is where a corporate inversion. Um, it's pretty straightforward how it works. Basically, what happens is when a company merges with an international company, they can choose to relocate their corporate headquarters in a different country. Okay. So uh, Burger King's shops won't change, um, although I did hear they recently started selling hot dogs, so okay. that's new, but I don't think that's a, a result of a corporate inversion. So stores don't change, employees typically don't change. Um, in fact, the leadership typically don't move to the different country. Mm -hmm. Everything is essentially the same. It's basically a paperwork deal. And this is uh, usually done with, with the goal of reducing the tax burden that companies like Burger King will pay in the United States. Now, Burger King's not the only one uh, company that's done this. It was just this last week, Pfizer, uh, the pharmaceutical company was who was, I guess, thinking about doing a corporate inversion announced that they weren't going to do that, right? Right. So Pfizer and Allegan, uh, it was announced that they recently considered inverting. But yeah, that deal is recently um, off from, from what I've heard. So mm -hmm. um, you get a lot of inversions that will, or uh, questions of inversions that will pop up. And sometimes they happen, sometimes they don't. But over the past 20 years or so, the number of companies 
in the United States that have inverted um, has increased quite a bit. And, and these, again, I think some of the other uh, companies, the, the Fruit of the Loom company, I, I thought was one that has jumped out of me mm -hmm. out of out of this list. Now, uh, you mentioned that it, it, the inversion hasn't affected the fact that Burger King still has their restaurants here in the United States. So, are corporate inversions different than the idea of offshoring jobs or relocating factories? Then. They definitely are. So a corporate inversion, again, is essentially a paperwork deal. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, oftentimes the physical headquarters won't change. So even though Burger King is uh, re headquartered in Ontario, they may have a headquarters here in, the, in North America or in, in the U.S. Still, I'm pretty sure they do. Um, so they're not offshoring anything. There's no Burger King jobs that are being sent to Canada now. Um, mm -hmm. Production's not taking place in Canada now, so none of their manufacturing plans have changed or anything like that. It's simply just so they can reduce um, their tax burden. And so then that gets into the question, like, uh, how is it that if, if the company's not actually, re you know, changing their operations, that they're able to get into, uh, that they're able to somehow reduce their taxes? And, and to get that, uh, let's ask the question, like, what taxes that they're uh, specifically being able to reduce or avoid in, in doing this? Sure, so what companies are able to reduce or avoid with a corporate inversion is the corporate income tax. Okay. Uh, so the corporate income tax is, I think corporations make up about 5% of businesses established in mm -hmm. the United States. So this isn't a tax that your small business owner is having to pay, um, but this is, this is what corporations pay on their gross income to the United States. And mm -hmm. we have a very unique system in the U.S. for corporate income taxation. So again, so if one of our viewers is start, owns their own business or started their own business, they probably not actually run into having to pay this tax, right? Exactly. Yeah, unless they are registered as an S corporation or a C corporation, mm -hmm. um, which again is about five percent of businesses in the United States, they're not seeing this tax. So it's a relatively small um, number of companies having to pay this tax, but. Um, corporate income does make up a substantial amount of the business income in the United mm -hmm. States. And so is, is, uh, we talk the corporate income, is, is that the equivalent of, of taxes, that, or not tax, of profits that these companies are earning? Sure. So if a company, if a corporation makes a profit and they subtract the cost of goods sold, essentially, that income that they have at the end of the day is what they pay taxes on. And so here's... Uh, so let's get into the question. If it's a corporate uh, tax that companies are trying to avoid uh, and they're, re they're reincorporating or, or changing their uh, official nation of incorporation, uh, it must be the case that the United States has a high corporate income tax, right? So there are two unique qualities of the U.S. corporate income tax. One is that we have the highest um, tax rate, corporate tax rate in the entire world. Mm -hmm. So the top marginal tax rate that a that a company based in the U.S. will pay is 35%. Um, I think the average in Europe is now 24%. Um, okay. Countries like Ireland have recently, somewhat recently, moved to 12.5% corporate income tax rate. Um, and when you also combine the top rate in the U.S. with uh, the, I think, average state corporate income tax rate, so if you're in Alabama or a different state, um, the top corporate income tax rate you'll pay is actually 39% total. Okay. So that's the first characteristic of the U.S. So, so we have, uh, this is the one case at least where we have, where we're a very high tax nation, right? Right. We have, again, we have the highest in the entire world now. Um, mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of countries, especially in Europe, have sort of gone, they've, they've done positive reform in, the, in terms of, we used to not have the highest, so other countries had really mm -hmm. high corporate income tax rates, but over the years, um, a lot of these countries have implemented reform and they've lowered their corporate tax rates. And this is a graph from your uh, paper, but it, I think it actually, we can actually see where that's uh, occurred, that uh, how it is that uh, the other developed or OECD com countries have actually reformed their corporate taxes recently, right? Exactly. Um, so the lighter blue line shows the OECD countries average without the United States. So this is mm -hmm. the top corporate income tax rate in the other OECD countries. It's steadily declined over the last 20 years or so, whereas the U.S. has stubbornly maintained a high corporate tax rate. Mm -hmm. And we can really see this after that uh, OECD average falls below the U.S. level that we start to see this spike in inversions, right? Right. So this also shows the number of inversions from the U.S. to other countries. Mm -hmm. And as you'll, yeah, as you see, there's been a fairly steady amount of inversions, and they've increased over time um, as the OECD average has fallen in, in other other countries. 
Now, there's actually, as you hinted at, there's actually a second element of the, the tax system, of our tax system here that uh, gives us a, a high burden on core companies. So if you can't try to explain this uh, second element of it. Sure. So the other unique characteristic of corporate tax in the United States is that um, we have a system of worldwide taxation. So mm -hmm. think of it in two ways. You have worldwide taxation and territorial. So what this means, let's say Burger King, for example. If Burger King has um, a store at the airport in London and they make, let's say, however much it is in a year, um, they are taxed in the UK on their corporate income there. I think UK currently has about 20% as their highest corporate mm -hmm. income tax rate. So they're quite a bit lower than the US as well. Um, so Burger King is taxed in the UK on their corporate income. When they bring, the, once they're taxed on that, when they bring the rest of that income back to the US, they're also taxed in the United States on that corporate income. Um, this is a system of worldwide taxation. So if you're headquartered in the United States, you essentially, once you bring your income back to the United States, you are also taxed at the U.S. rates. Um, this is not the case for most countries. I think the U.S. is one of only six countries in the whole world that currently practices worldwide taxation. Um, and, and that's significant in our part because we do have the higher rate, mm -hmm. right? So if we had a lower rate than everyone else, then companies wouldn't end up paying, wouldn't end up owing anything because they had already paid a higher rate uh, for for their taxes uh, in the UK, right? Exactly. So, um, and this is what's kind of unique about it too, is that, so in the US, if you pay taxes overseas on your business, once you bring that income back, you are allowed to deduct what you mm -hmm. paid in taxes overseas, but you're still subject to the highest rate. So basically you're still paying up to the highest rate you would in the United States. Um, but a company headquartered in, let's say Canada, like Burger King is now, they're only, so their business in Canada is now only subject to Canadian taxation. Mm -hmm. Whereas before, when they were headquartered in the US, every Burger King shop in Canada um, would also be taxed in the US once that income was repatriated to the US. So just to, again, to be clear, of the uh, Burger King restaurants that they have here in the US, this inversion isn't actually reducing the amount of taxes that they're paying to the US government. They would still be paying the corporate tax on whatever income those restaurants earned. And since it's higher than the Canadian tax rate, it wouldn't matter if, they're, they would, if Canada would try to tax Burger King on that or not. Right. It's just a, it's their earnings on their operations in other countries that, are, that we're, we're really taxing high and that, that's why they're trying to get around that, right? Yeah, so this is also a very important distinction to make because I think it often gets lost in the discussion is that um, by inverting to a different country, whatever business, Burger King for example, again, whatever business they have in the U.S., they are still taxed in the U.S. on that business. Mm -hmm. So um, our local Burger King in Troy, Alabama is still being taxed at the U.S. rates. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not also having to pay a different tax rate elsewhere now that it's inverted to Canada. And and so then if, if you look at the different kinds of companies that have been engaging in these inversions, I mean, there, there have been a lot of like pharmaceutical companies, Pfizer, although they decided not to go ahead with theirs, was, was you know, one of those. And pharmaceutical companies do get a lot of their revenue from selling. They have a lot of international sales, right? Yes, they do. So a lot of companies with a lot of international business are the ones who this makes a lot of sense for. Mm -hmm. If you can lower your tax burden by you know, relocating or reincorporating in a different country without having to change much of your operations, then it's a smart move for companies like Pfizer. Well, another thing that's closely related to our, our corporate tax policy is, is the fact that although we have this very high corporate tax rate, I mean, a lot of companies uh, that make a lot of money don't seem to pay a lot of corporate taxes in our system, right? Yeah, this is a good point. So this is also something that's missed is that um, a lot of corporations, the, the rates are really high, but a lot of times we hear about all the, all the loopholes that are in the tax mm -hmm. system for corporations. I um, mean, the tax code is very complex. There are a lot of, a lot of tax breaks in the U.S. tax code for corporations. Um, they're also for a lot of businesses, but corporations bring in around 64% of business income in the United States, U.S. corporations. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're a huge part of, of the U.S. economy. Um, but the important part is talking about who actually pays taxes when you're talking about corporate income tax. Mm -hmm. And again, through all the different uh, complexities, loopholes, tax credits they, they get available, a, a lot of big companies still end up not paying anything actually close to that statutory rate, right? Right. That is, yeah, that was an important distinction. A lot of corporations don't pay the highest rate. So 
Um, they're taking advantage of the, the tax incentives that have been offered to them in the U.S. And, and then sometimes they also lobby for, to get those uh, tax incentives put in place. And so in that regard, we can sort of see inversions as part of a larger effort that's go been going on uh, amongst American corporations to take something, you know, take some kind of action to not have to pay this high rate. Certainly, yeah. I mean, the lower the lower the tax burden for a corporation, the better. So of course they're going to lobby for you know, tax incentives or lower rates. But um, again, talking about who actually pays a corporate income tax in the United States economy is important too, because it, you know it, it sounds great to say, well, a wealthy corporation should pay more in taxes. That, I don't think that's a you know controversial controversial argument. Um, but the issue is when you actually get down to it, who's actually paying? The corporate income tax. Yeah, that's an important that's an important question to get into here because I mean I'm sure some of our viewers are probably saying like, well, we have to collect you know the, the federal government spends 3.7 trillion dollars a year, they have to collect taxes from somebody. Uh, corporations are pretty rich. Why not have them pay more of the taxes and have less taxes on the rest of us, right? Right. Yeah, that's certainly fair. And, and but. This gets into a whole question that economists talk about with, with regard to what's known as the incidence of a tax. If you could, like, uh, again, this is another complicated question to get into, but if you can, try to explain to us, what, what do we mean by the incidence of a, a tax? Sure, so the incidence of a tax is basically where it falls. Mm -hmm. So if, you're, if, if the price of something, if you add the taxes to it, who's actually who's actually taking that tax burden? Is it the corporation? Is it the workers? Is it the employee? Is it the customer? So where, where is this tax burden actually being shifted mm -hmm. once you add it to prices? And so if you take the case of a, like a gas tax, which you know, maybe is a, a simpler one because we all buy gas and sort of pay gas taxes even though we may not be aware of how much of the tax is you know, in the price at the pump. Mm -hmm. uh, if we impose, like say, a 25 cent per gallon uh, tax on gasoline, would we say, you know, some people might say like, oh, well, gas companies will just pass that tax on, on to consumers and, and so consumers will end up paying that, right? Right. That is often the argument made. Um, and with the corporate income tax, of course, this has gone back and forth with economists. It's a very difficult issue to sort of get down to the actual answer. Um, but a lot of times what we've seen is that, so if, if customers are the ones paying the tax, and this is certainly an argument that's been made by economists, um, but one that we're seeing now is that who's actually facing this incidence are um, the shareholders and the mm -hmm. workers of these companies. They're the ones who are actually facing um, a higher tax burden. And this is not that they're being taxed directly, right? This mm -hmm. is, again, the company has to pay more tax on whatever business activity they have. And what's actually happening is it's, fall it's falling on the um, capital holders, which are often not these, you know, fat cats in, in or Washington or something, but they're people... Who, are, who have pensions or uh, people who who are working for these corporations? Yeah. So, so any any American who owns who has a, a 401k stock plan is in part a, a owner of some of these big co uh, corporations, right? Exactly. And so, when we say like, oh, well, corporate tax that'd be good because rich people would pay it. I mean, a lot of folks who or just average Americans and have a pension plan are paying a part of this tax, right? Right, exactly. And this is not um, this is not something that corporations have designed to where the tax burden falls on on pension holders. This is just simply the economics of taxes. Um, the incidence mm -hmm. of taxes is is uh, really unique in that. Yeah, corporations don't pay. They are technically set up as I think per as people as right. a tax entity, but that's not the case when you actually get down to the economics of it. In then there's also the whole question of, because as you mentioned, there's multiple different uh, uh, theories about who actually pays the corporate tax in, mm -hmm. in the first place. And there, there could actually be other, uh, other people who you paying, including some of the workers working in the corporate sector, depending on uh, the, the, the model that you want to try to apply to, to try and figure out who's paying the corporate tax, right? Yes, definitely. Um, so again, this is something that economists recently have, have come up with is looking at how it affects labor and the labor of corporations. Um, so is it affecting the factory worker? The factory worker, if that's the case, we definitely want to take a look at, at how we can reduce the corporate income tax burden. And then I guess uh, there's also a question of if we have a, a complex and, or, or to some extent hidden tax that you know, people aren't aware is being imposed, I mean, then that's another whole question altogether. We, we have a tax, we're not sure who's paying the tax. Uh, most Americans probably aren't aware of how much uh, corporations are, are paying in taxes or 
some of the efforts that they're able to take to reduce their, their burdens. I mean, it sounds like a, a tax that's fraught with a lot of problems. It is. Um, the corporate tax code, as the tax code in the U.S. itself, is incredibly complex. Um, it's grown substantially over time, and as the, the complexity grows, it becomes more, a company has to focus more on tax compliance and making sure that they're receiving the best, the best tax deal they can, depending on where they're located, mm -hmm. than they are focusing on the consumer. So in Burger King, for yeah. example, if they're not able, if they're having to spend more time focusing on, you know, where should they be headquartered, where should they relocate, and they're using their resources to, to, to talk about the tax code and that sort of thing, whereas they're not thinking about how to make better products for consumers. Mm -hmm. It's much harder when you have to spread your resources throughout a company. I, I think that's an important point that, uh, I mean, whatever our, our system of taxes, taxation is, I mean, what we really want, where our economy is going to grow is if companies are trying to produce better products, right? If, if their first and foremost efforts are, are focused on how do we make better food, how do we make if your Burger King, how do you make your uh, meals more attractive to consumers, uh, tastier, healthier, whatever it might be, and how can we better con uh, serve our consumers? Now, how can we take steps on paper to you know shuffle things around and, and reduce our tax burden right exactly and i think that's a sign too you see how complex the tax code is and how burdensome it is if a company is taking drastic measures where you know it's, it's spending all this time um, thinking about re relocating or reincorporating its headquarters again even if it's just on paper it's still a substantial amount of resources burger king has to devote to to thinking about this in the first mm -hmm. place um, and so, yeah, that becomes a huge part of U.S. corporations where they're having to focus on the political realities instead of focusing on the consumer. Now, another approach you think, like, oh, if we're, we have a problem with these uh, corporate inversions, then, well, why couldn't the government just take some action to say, let's stop corporate inversions? And in fact, uh, the, there was a bill that Congress was considering a, a couple of years ago to, like, stop corporate inversions. Hasn't the Treasury Department or, or the IRS or hasn't anybody taken uh, tried to take any steps to, to halt these uh, inversions over the years? They have. So the federal government um, and the IRS, they're they're a little bit ahead of us in this regard. So since the, about the the 80s and 90s, um, one of the one of the major first corporate inversions that caught the attention of the Treasury and IRS was Helen of Troy, mm -hmm. um, which is a big company headquartered out of Texas, and they they inverted and. The Treasury and the IRS started issuing regulations that basically made it more difficult for a company to invert for tax purposes. Mm -hmm. So what they did was they basically increased the complexity. They said certain ownerships had to be um, higher than they were previously for you to invert and not have to face U.S. taxation um, on your worldwide income. But over the years, um, the amount of regulations that the IRS and the Treasury have issued to try to stop corporate inversions, as you saw in the, in the previous graph, corporate inversions from the U.S. have still occurred. Um, so it's still very profitable for a company to invert, even as we've tried to impose regulation throughout the years um, designed to stop these, and it hasn't worked. And, and so it's a lot harder to try to, you know, when you get down to the nuts and bolts or the details to try and say you can't do a, a corporate inversion to, for, for tax purposes. Because, I mean, ultimately what is underlying a lot of these things are international mergers, right? So right. If, if, two if a U.S. company is going to merge with a, a European or a Canadian company, uh, then there's always some possibility that they could, you know, they, they have to make a decision about where they're going to have their overall headquarters, right? Exactly. Um, and the thing is, as we increase regulation, even if, you know, they haven't worked up to this point, they haven't stopped many corporate inversions, if they have at all, but you have to think about it in terms of you, in terms of policy in the U.S. Do we really want the United States to basically put a stranglehold on businesses to decide where they where they locate their headquarters? Mm -hmm. um, that seems to be sort of the opposite of what you want. You want businesses to flourish. You want them to be able to make the best decisions that they can for you know to lo lower costs and to employ more people. But when we have federal policy saying that you know they're trying to put a stranglehold increasingly on corporations to do, to make business decisions. It's bad policy. Yeah, so I mean, if you simply try to, you know, if the Treasury simply try, try to have a, a rule say, like, U.S. corporations can't merge with other companies, you know, from Canada or, or, or Europe, I mean, that would be really costly to our economy, right? Because, I mean, sometimes it makes perfect sense to, for, for a U.S. company and, say, a German company to merge, right? Absolutely. So it's, it, that would be really costly to the U.S. economy, but corporate inversions currently are costly mm -hmm. um, because we're basically we're keeping prosperity out of the United States by 
keeping profits that companies are making out of the U.S. So if it makes sense for a company to reincorporate elsewhere, right, we're keeping them out of the U.S. in a lot of ways. If a company is still headquartered in the U.S. And, or in, incorporated in the U.S. and has business activity elsewhere, it can choose to hold its profits or its income overseas until it, until there's a tax holiday or something where they're not mm -hmm. paying that corporate income tax. So we're basically encouraging companies to keep their money overseas rather than bringing it to the U.S. And, and how much money approximately is being held overseas right now? That's a good question. I don't think we know. Mm -hmm. um, that would, but that would be a really interesting question to answer. But it's a pretty substantial amount, isn't it? Oh, it's got to be a substantial amount. I mean, we're talking about billions of dollars in corporate income that mm -hmm. is on the table here. And again, it's not, I mean, although it has the effect of trying to reduce their taxes, it, it, you know, there are a lot of factors involved. So like why you're holding money outside of the United States or, or again, with these uh, mergers. I mean, you know, there are perfectly good reasons to, to merge. And then uh, once you decide to merge, taxes are a perfectly legitimate uh, question for businesses to be asking. Like, how, how can we reduce our tax burden, right? Absolutely. I mean, it's a question that any business um, has to answer. So we think about it in terms of you know, corporations being these, these giant businesses in the U.S., and they are, but it's also important to think about every individual, every business in the U.S. tries to think about how to, you know, reduce their tax burden. So ultimately, then, what do you think the, uh, the thing we should do to try to reduce corporate inversions or, or, or the other things? Should we try and, do you think that there's a, a, magic, uh, a magic bullet out there or some kind of uh, regulations that the Treasury could come up with to stop these corporate inversions? Or, or do you think we really need to address the corporate tax as sort of the root cause of this? Yeah, I think we need to address the root cause rather than the symptoms, which is what the IRS and Treasury have done in the past. I think what we need to do, first of all, is lower the statutory tax rates on corporate income mm -hmm. um, to match maybe the, the European average of 24%, or if we want to, maybe around 20%, and that way when you add in state corporate income tax, then you're mm -hmm. meeting the 24%. So, I mean, all all that really matters in terms of pol in corporate income tax policy right now is that we're just we're not asking for a significantly lower rate than the rest of the world. We're just asking to be on par with the rest of the world in terms of what corporations are paying. Um, so that's one thing is lower the lower the corporate income tax rates. The other really important part of that is moving to a system of territorial taxation. So mm -hmm. instead of taxing the money that a corporation based in the U.S. makes elsewhere. Mm -hmm. only tax them on the business they do within the U.S. So we could do either one of those as a way to sort of uh, address the, the cause of corporate inversions, either reduce our tax rate so it's in line with uh, other developed countries, or just say you only have to pay our high tax rate on business in, in the United States. Exactly. Yeah, there there's somewhat substitutes in that sense. And again, it goes back to just making it attractive again for uh, corporations to stay in the U.S., which is important for our economy. In, in maybe simplifying the, the corporate tax uh, system altogether, right? Because if we could somehow reduce all these different loopholes, in, including possibly cor corporate inversions, corporations are gonna spend more time on their core business, which is like trying to serve customers, right? Exactly, so you're, by simplifying the corporate tax code, you're essentially unlocking a corporation's ability to spend its to focus its efforts elsewhere. Um, and hopefully those efforts will be focused on the consumer rather than focusing on what's happening in Washington. And then that would make us all better off as our prosperity rose, right? That absolutely would. Um, I'm not sure how the, how the Whoppers at Burger King have changed since the inversion, but hopefully they've gotten better, even better. Well, thanks very much for coming on and, and, and making sense of this, uh, thing, this topic in the news and also a very complicated and I think you've done a good job. And thank you for joining us. Join us again next time for another eConversations. I'll just do a promo. Okay.